Saluton! Saluton! All right. Uh, first week of history back from uh, Thanksgiving. I'm going to say a uh, full house here today. Uh, the club members of one. Um, but, uh, oh. so um, today our topic is uh, the Turbinia, uh, the ship that revolutionized uh, naval ships and also power generation and engines and is probably one of, or if not the uh, most unknown uh, and overshadowed, maybe not overshadowed, but just unknown invention in, in history. So, uh, I'll pose to a question, how important is naval force and uh, why does it matter? If you, <laughs> if you and Nikki would like to answer or if you just want to go well, along. I'll look at it this way. The other guys have got ships, so you got to have ships too. All right. Makes sense. All right, so let's uh, dive into the Turbinia. Let's picture it on the right. So an introduction. First, to Charles um, Algernon Parsons, the inventor of uh, the Turbinia. Uh, he lived from 1854 to 1931. Um, and we'll also be going over what a steam, or steam turbine engine is. Uh, both a steam engine and a steam turbine engine, as in different things, as well as uh, going over the turbinia and what that was. So first, we of course have to get some background. Uh, let's start with a little bit on the Napoleonic Wars, uh, just to get an understanding of the state of the British Navy in the mid, the early mid uh, 1800s. Um, and so throughout the time, the British Navy basically dunked on the French Navy. Um, and also a lot um, contributed by Sir Sidney Smith, who had burned half the French fleet early on and also had destroyed most of the French fleet in Egypt that stranded Napoleon and his army in the Middle East. So I guess good to him. Um, and the British also captured a large amount of French ships. And so because of this, they, they didn't really use a lot of research and development for the Navy. They didn't fund their research firms and their dockyards because you know they're capturing all these state-of-the-art French ships that they could just use in their in their navy so there's no reason to put more money into researching and developing when you already have these nice ships that you've captured and repaired. Um, and so for a time after the Napoleonic Wars there wasn't much development or advancement of British ships um, and they kind of stayed as they were a little bit getting into steam engines as well. Yeah? There's three pieces in the library. Ah, that's probably where they are. Maybe they'll come up uh, pretty soon. All right. So now let's go over to steam-powered engines. Uh, here we have, uh, I assume, a demonstration model of a steam engine, very small scale. Uh, but for steam engine, sure everyone's heard it, but to go over kind of how it works. Uh, here, I believe, is where the steam or water would be held, and then you would heat up that area and it would increase the pressure inside of it because now all the water is boiling into steam and because as much more energy it moves around in that and as it gets more and more energy it moves around even more uh, and it increases the pressure so much that that pushes up this piston um, and eventually releases the pressure. Hello. Hello. Uh, and once this is pushed up it turns this wheel, it translates the pressure into a rotational force which can be used to power something. Uh, so that's how a steam engine works. Uh, a steam turbine engine is a bit different. Uh, we'll get into it a bit later. Um, and of course also these steam engines aren't exactly quite new or quite novel. There's even such thing called um, Hero's engine, which is a steam powered engine invented in ancient Greece uh, near, the, near about 50 what? BC. Yeah. They had engines? They had uh, an engineer, um, I forgot his full name, but Heroes, it's called Heroes Engine. He, he made a, a steam powered engine in about 50 BC. It was basically this, this base with uh, two stands and a big ball full of water and two outlets. 
um, and when you heat it up, it would spew steam out and it would spin it. Uh, although it was more of like a novelty rather than an actual engine to power anything, because it only generated one or two watts of, uh, of, of energy from this. Um, but yeah, so yeah, these aren't quite, steam powered things aren't really all that new or novel. They've been around for quite a while. In so, ancient Greece? Ancient Greece, yeah. That's a long time. Here is hey, Agnes, you think okay, they greased up the engine? Show it though. What does it look like? Hey, Magnus. I just, here, let's see. Magnus. Yeah. Do you think they greased up the engine? <laughs> Our hero's engine. Thank you. Uh, so okay, this is what hero's engine it looks like. Does that have an actual like, purpose? No, it's it more like a novelty. novelty. Like a novelty of engineering, and like if you're rich enough, you can get this and be like, have guests like, oh, look at this, it spins on its own. <laughs> look at this, guys, but <laughs> this little ball I have spins. Um, oh, so yeah, it's like spinning. Yeah, so, um, but it's not, it does, it like generates one or two watts of electricity, or not electricity, of oh. energy, um, or one or two watts equivalent to electricity, so it doesn't, it can't really power that much. Uh, but yeah, that concept has been around for a very long time, so steam engines and steam turbine engines aren't particularly like take, crazy. Why did, it why did it take them like so long to figure it out? Because well, probably no one thought that there was an actual practical use. Yeah. They had like windmills and stuff for a while or like trees, like grinding. Yeah. That was just a grind. Or animals. You know. Yeah. All right. So let's get into Wait. it. So they knew like, people knew that this was a concept of like something moving from steam mm -hmm. uh, since ancient Greece, and it took them until the industrial revolution to, to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess like, you know, if you're like Genghis Khan, you know, you're not gonna really be thinking about steam powered engines. If you're like King Arthur the first. Well, I guess they didn't have manufacturing or like Yeah. Well, we also have to think about uses. Yeah, that's true. What do you mean uses? There's plenty of uses like but back then where they practiced. Yeah, they were farming, like just replacing uh, draft animals that were used for everything. Yeah. All right. So let's look into uh, Parsons. Uh, he was a son of an earl. He was homeschooled, and he uh, actually attended Cambridge University. Son of an earl. Mm -hmm. So was he homeschooled or did he attend Cambridge? Well, he, uh, he homeschooled for like most of his childhood and teenagers and then he was able to go to Cambridge University for his uh, advanced education. Mm. And uh, from then he was an apprentice engineer at Armstrong, later the famous Vickers Armstrong that constructed tanks and guns for the British in World War I and World War II. Um, and then he also bought a telescope factory. Uh, I believe this might be one of them. Uh, and so he, he also became a, a very famous astronomer, not very famous, but he became a well-known astronomer in the field of astronomy. And he was able to manufacture and build and sell many of the world's uh, telescopes. Um, and also for a brief uh, period of time, he was the president of the Royal Society, uh, which has people like Stephen Hawking or Sir Isaac Newton, uh, great scientists and engineers of the like, in the Royal Society, and so which Parsons was president of for uh, a small amount of time. Uh, so moving on, get, um, so again, the steam, even the steam turbine engines was not really new, but there wasn't really a practical use that was found for them. Uh, but Parsons had developed a practical steam, a practical uh, steam turbine engine, and decided to, uh, a ship was its best use for demonstrating how well it worked. And so, and again, with the usual steam engine, you have the piston and the steam that push up the piston. And so that had to be translated into rotational energy to power a ship. Um, and also when the piston... Expansion, expansion yeah. engines. Yeah, what are you doing? Ooh. Continue. No. <laughs> Continue. I don't know what you're doing. I'm not doing anything. No. Mushrooms. Nikita, no. watch your mushrooms. Fine. 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 Mushrooms. Mushrooms? Okay. Oh wait. Yeah, it's fine, it's all good, it's all good. Okay. Let's get the full reveal now. Alright. 
Oh, so yeah, steam, so a steam engine has a piston and a, and a chamber for the steam, and it pushes the piston up, and then it has to stop to come back down, and it does it over and over again, and that has to be translated, that vertical energy has to be translated into rotational energy. Uh, but with the steam turbine engine, it is already rotational energy, and how it works is, basically you have a compartment of water that you bring into steam, and then it moves through these many bladed fans. It looks a lot like a jet engine, if you can imagine that. Um, and then it spins those to create a rotational movement, so you don't need to translate that, because it already is rotational movement. Yeah? So this was the first ship that, was, that like, wasn't powered entirely by wind? No, there are already steam ships, but this was the first steam turbine powered ship. So like, at the time, the British Navy had like, kind of hybrid ships. They oh, have... How do steam ships work? The steam ships would work with, they had triple expansion engines in the middle of the ship that would turn a big old wheel that would pick up and push water behind it. Oh. Yeah. And these were very inefficient, which is, which is why all the ships at the time still had masts. So when they sailed long distance, they would use the sails to conserve coal and energy. But when they were in battle, they'd use the steam engines. At the, time, the they were also, boats, at the time they were yeah, also yeah, not the river boats, but like 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 in the British like British military ships that would have to sail from like Britain all the way to like India. Were ironclads like that, or did they have turbines? They were tur uh, I think they were just steam powered ships, so they wouldn't like go on long journeys. They would just be very local. They were also very unreliable at the time. Yeah, um, and so Parkson saw this. He said, you know, this can be very practical. Um, and so, you know, he never really built a ship, so he just decided, you know what, I'm going to design a ship because, you know, he's a Victorian era guy, you know, these, these people did many things and nothing really stopped them. So he designed the ship, even though he never de designed one, and it happened to be a pretty good ship. So he commissioned a sheet metal working yard to construct it, and they never built the ship, they just worked sheet metal. But they built it anyways. And he had it in one year after designing it. Anyway, he had, he had it one year after starting to design it. Oh, yeah. So it was... Be that be long, Musk. Oh, yeah. Um, and so he got this crazily quickly, actually. And this was about 1895 or 96, around that area. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. You're late. I was at a board meeting. Late. Did they have pizza? And I already told him. Did they have pizza then? No, they never had pizza. Um, all right. So we talked about uh, Parsons a bit. Let's talk about his turbine engine. It's a large engine. So a turbine is a which I hope you see with the analogousness of it all. Um, so yeah, it was actually directly driven. So you have the engine, and the engine would go straight into the propellers, or what a proper naval man would say, screws. So you don't need, it, there's no gearbox. You just fuel it, and then it just goes all the way, straight to the, straight to the screws. And it had a fantastic 12% energy efficiency, which it uh, doesn't sound like much, but it is still 1% more than a theoretical maximum efficiency of photosynthesis and much more efficient than most ships at the time. The photosynthesis? It has a theoretical maximum 11% energy efficiency. Um, and it's also three times faster than any other ship in the British Navy at the time. Um, here are specifications of the Turbinia. It weighed about 44.5 tons. It was 32 meters in length, that's about 104 feet. Uh, it was a beam of 2.7 meters, meaning it's wide as uh, 2.7 meters. And its maximum speed was 34.5 knots. Very fast. Yes. And it had an ideal crew of 64, and there was no armament. Uh, which means it doesn't have any better weapons. efficiency. Yeah? So did the Navy like commission this or something? Or no, he just built it on his own. Yeah. And then sold it? Or? No, he just wanted to demonstrate it to them. What? Well, did they like buy it from him? They did take it. They, he literally. Yeah, he's he about to explain. He just built a goddamn like. Yeah, he just built it on his own. He's, he's like, hey, he could. he's like, hey, look at this. You like it? <laughs> you can Basically, for a yeah. Put guns on it. Was he rich? Yeah, he well, sold. I mean, he sold. He sold telescopes. Oh yeah. So he was, you know. Um, so this thing was incredibly fast. With stup and stupendously powerful. This thing was so fast, the bow of the boat reaches outside of the water. This thing is 32 meters long. Do you know how much power you need to raise the front of the boat out of the water? How fast are boats nowadays, though? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. They're not that much faster. Even, even you see in this, 
you see the screws, they're angled downwards because originally it was straight up forward and it would rise too far up and it would lose energy. So he had to angle it down to keep the bow straight, but even still, the bow would raise above this. And this thing was still so fast, it was difficult to shove in coal fast enough to keep the current speed. Wait, so did he like build it on a motor? Did he like hire yeah. people to help him build a boat? Yeah, he hired a sheet metal working yard. And with this immense speed and power came a new problem that has never been seen before in the, in the Navy. Cavitation. Something called cavitation, which you might have heard. And this is a, a machine he built on a smaller scale to photograph and document what this actually is. This is a, like a small chamber with a small screw. What's cavitation? He's about to explain. Oh. Yes. Um, and so basically what cavitation is, is so like let's say we have water, right? We have two bits of water here. Okay. And the propeller blade in the middle. Yeah, okay, and it's just sitting here, and it's all fine. And then a really fast boat comes in, and the propeller splits it between them. Now, because of the angle, it creates a really high pressure on this water. And so, and, and so there's so much pressure here, but you know, water isn't very compressible, so it resists, and it pushes back on the propeller, and it pushes on the boat, which is what you want. But on the other side, it is extraordinarily low pressure, so low in fact that the water actually boils. Um, not that it's actually... Not that it actually, um, not to confuse it with like it's being heated up. Um, it just goes from liquid to like, gas. Like how you know, if you go on top of a mountain, uh, it gets easier to boil water. And that's because it's so low pressure that it just boils at the current temperature. Um, and so then gas forms in the water, which, and, and bubbles go out. But um, it's more likely that these bubbles form on an actual surface. So they form on the back of the propeller blade um, but Which once slowly chips away at the propeller. Kind of, and it's and what it does actually is the gas, then uh, because the pressure normalizes, the gas turns um, has to dissipate and turn back into water. And so with these bubbles on the propeller, instead of this like closing down, what it do is it would go straight down the middle really quickly. And what Parsons found was this would actually damage the screws, and it would be so hard that it would dent or even crack the the screws because of how fast this cavitation was. And so from this here, they completely redesigned naval screws um, to ensure the perfect angle to get the most performance and also ha not have these screws be damaged by cavitation. And so he did this. And no longer was the propellers or screws affected by cavitation at all. What did they do to fix it? Huh? Just replace the propellers. Yeah, they'd have to replace the propellers. So but they, like, didn't, they didn't find a solution, they just treated the problem? Well, they did. Well, it was to change the angles of the propellers and, and the different curvatures of it so that it's more, resist, it's more resistant to the damaging of it. Oh. So it was no longer damaged after he had tuned it. And so now it was finished, everything was tuned perfectly, and so now it just had to show uh, the British Navy. Um, although the initial reception was that, I mean, the, ben the benefits and advantages were known, all of these were known, the immense speed, the efficiency and just how great this ship was, was widely known by the British Navy and Parsons himself. But the very first prototypes, the, the, there were some disappointing first tests and the, the Navy viewed it as insignificant and decided it's not worth their time. Uh, so they kind of like tossed it aside. Um, so what Parsons did, most likely in frustration at the Navy's uh, like throwing aside of the Turbinia, he wanted to go and embarrass them. So at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee Naval Review, which is when all the Navy's best ships come out in front of the Queen, except the Queen decided not to come uh, for personal reasons. She sent her son, the Prince of Wales, there. Um, Prince Charles. I'm kidding. Uh, and so there are also many other international attendees and admirals of the Navy, and many uh, bystanders of the local area was there to watch. Um, That'd be a very good target during the war, just to have all the ships in one place. Well, that's, what do you think happened to Pearl Harbor? Yeah, exactly. yeah they, they, It's like Pearl Harbor, but like British. Yeah, but they're not really at war right now. But if they were. Yeah, well they wouldn't do this if they're yeah. at war. Yeah. Um, and so, so all these ships were sailing by in front of uh, people saying hooray at their full, and they were going, you know, um, at like well, 10 knots. And then suddenly this, the Turbinia, comes by, Zooming past all the other ships at nearly three times faster. Yes, and honestly, it is really hard not to notice something going three times the speed of uh, of everything else. 
Um, and so, of course, uh, the British were quite embarrassed by this. Um, <laughs> because, of course, if, like, if, if, you're, if your ships can go three times faster than any of, of the enemy ships, then, of course, you're just going to win. You can maneuver around them, and there's nothing the enemy can do about it. Um, and so the British, uh, seemingly conservative, uh, what they're depicted as conservative and slow about this, uh, they actually weren't because uh, they commissioned ships from Parsons later to create, uh, with this riveting display at the Naval Review, Parsons was commissioned to construct two steam turbine destroyers called Viper class destroyers, which were also fast and also still have the bow outside of the water because of how fast it is, but also now have guns and torpedoes on them to fight in a war. Were um, they ever used? Uh, I don't, I'm, maybe, maybe. I'm not 100% sure on the two destroyers that were used and if they fought World War I. Uh, but by 1906, every single ship that was to be constructed now was to be with a steam turbine engine. Um, and by 1914, every single ship in service in the British Navy was run by a steam turbine engine. Um, and so thus came uh, the dreadnought. Quite literally, fear not, dread not. Um, with, it also built with a steam uh, turbine engine, and it rendered the world's fleets completely obsolete. Nothing is faster than this ship, nothing was as powerful as this ship, and nothing could penetrate the ship's armor. Nothing actually, and everything was under range at the ship. So anything you threw at this, you'd be blown out of the water. Look at these huge guns, these are 12 inch guns. 12 inch guns, can you imagine things being. This could would blow your face off. Yeah. Blow more your face off. A little more. This. <laughs> so, and this was built in 1906, and for two whole years, this was the best ship in the world until the Germans built their own. So, what was that one called? Uh, it was, I mean, at this point, all these kinds of ships were called dreadnoughts. Mm -hmm. But another innovation of the steam turbine engine was since these ships, the old ships, had masts blocking huge amounts of space. Now with the steam turbine ship with hugely more effective uh, energy, uh, energy use, they didn't need masts, so they got rid of them and they were able to get these big guns yeah, and these big things and more deck space. And they're 12% efficiency. That's still a lot, you know? <laughs> it is, but like... It's they're probably a little more than just 12% if we're considering the fact that it rendered the world's fleets obsolete. <laughs> for what it's made for, I think. We'll see. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. Um, yeah. What did they do? What did they sell the mask? For radios and for. No, they're probably like observation. I but I don't really know. Uh, but but it, like, it kind of looks like it has the. But it's, it, that's not gonna like sail really. Um, but I mean, you know, masks would have like you have like three masks usually in old ships. Your aerodynamics. One or two. Not, <laughs> there's, there's no real issue with aerodynamics. Well, it looks kind of ugly. Yeah, it's a dreadnought. I think it looks cool. Or ships aren't made to look pretty. Like I think it looks cool. Well, this was in 1906, okay? This was at the same time in The Jungle, okay? Is this when? The Jungle. The, the Jungle, the book. Um, the same year. you're reading. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also, and yeah, you know, this actually could dreadnought. Uh -huh. Didn't have to fear. Um, like the hair style? <laughs> yeah. What? Um, yeah. Oh, wait, no. So yeah, and, uh, and you know, even still, the effects of the steam turbine engine are felt to this day. Nuclear, you know, nuclear power plants, nuclear reactors, they're powered by steam turbine engines. Mm -hmm. they're, they basically boil water uh, from, with energy and, and it goes through a steam turbine to then generate that energy. So even still, Parsons invention affects us to this day, even in elect electrical generation. Wait a minute. Yeah. But dreadnought means not to dread, no? Yeah, yeah. Fear not, um, dreadnought. Yeah, uh, that's what I said. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, that's it. These are my problems. Okay. Um, okay, I see your APA 7th edition citation. Because you're requested, Kuda. I, I, oh, so this is the Kuda. I quoted you Parsons here. Quoted I used Parsons? Yes, I, I read I read Parsons' works. <laughs> I you read, can still I read see Parsons some work. you can still see some old 
Um, Older designs still around today. So yeah. Okay, this is good. I we improved. We improved. I'll I'll try and keep this up every week now. Yeah, you better. We're gonna remove your entire history club. Alright. I'll turn on the entire club before that happens. <laughs> no kidding. Um alright, of course Jets for next week. Yes. Uh three members. Uh, please don't all vote one for each. You know, I was always yeah, confused about the I was always confused about the spice trade because you know Britain. Literally spice trade, like, mice trade. I want sub, jets. I also want jets. Uh, Britain literally subjugated India for like years for for their spices, and yet their food is still bland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Um, yeah, Wait a minute. Where's Gordon Ramsay from? He's from England. England. So England. what? Does that make so sense? What it does? You were, you just said he went to France. Food is, is uh, really bland. Yeah. His food is bland. Is it? I I've never. I don't know. Anyway, it's let's like, get to voting. No, no, no. It's like beans and like <laughs> fish and chips and sausages. The beans and the fish and chips too. Yeah. And eggs. Fish and chips aren't bad. Eggs aren't bad. All right. Uh, let's uh, three members. Let's get to voting. Um, jets. Jets among the first looking at into jets. Uh, jets win. To Shana, why spice you trade. Do you do this? I think we all know the Nikita, you want spice trade? No? You don't want spice trade? <laughs> Fashion through the ages? You want? Oh, I'll vote for that. Uh, you, you guys want, you, Shana, you want to vote for Fashion through the ages? Yeah. Then the runner up is Jets. Broad, so then we do Jets next, then we I guess guess we should Well, this is the topic well, Shana's jets, are, yeah. jets aren't specific either. Well, I, I'm, on, I, I'm talking about the invention of Jets. Oh. oh. Do you guys really want to do fashion through the ages? I got Magnus on today. It was up there last week. Well, because yeah. Shana put And you guys kept voting for it. Shana, oh, that's you, true. You want to do fashion or spice trade? Fashion. Well, then, like, what, will, will we, like, spin the wheel or something if, if each one gets one vote? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm going to do spice trade then. Okay. Spin the wheel. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, uh. Do we I'll do create a recount? Stop the count. <laughs> um, I'll I'll do a Discord. I'll do a vote on Discord. I'll. It's gonna be Jets. If you do it on Discord. Maybe maybe. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think it's spicy because like you know the the Dutch actually like was really powerful in the spice trade. Like they owned a lot of the spice trade throughout. Question. Yeah. You're Dutch. You live in the Netherlands, correct? Yes. So why is it not called Dutchland? That would make more sense. Where did they get Dutch from Netherlands? That does it's not It's just make the sense. kind of people. Well, How I does, don't know. Are where you? does that come from? We live in America. We are Americans. That makes sense. Well, like, technically, right? Mexicans would therefore be American as well because yeah. Mexicans are North America. But this is the United States. But Mexicans are Mexicans. Though. Yeah, but they're also considered Latinos, which is basically like the but rest no of the continent. country in North America calls itself America. But then Canadians are Americans. But they're Canadians. They named their country Canada. Oh, well. We named our country after the continent. We're not that original. Well, it's called the United States of America. Yeah, so we're not we're not all American. Yeah. We're United States. We're in the United States. Plus, like... We're not United Statesians, though. Well, yeah, because that's not our defining... Exactly. That's that's my point. Where did the Dutch come from? Like, where's the origin of that well, word? Because that's, 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 that's what their people are. If you're British, you're from like you no, know. No, but British. listen, well, listen. Okay, they were they, they, the they were they were owned by the Spanish, and they called okay. the Spanish called them Dutch. Thank you. They liberated themselves. Why did they call them Dutch? Where did that's what their people where were called. Come from? I don't know. Ask the Spanish. What did they call themselves? I don't know the Dutch. Maybe I'll get. I'll I'll make this its own section in the spice trade. The Dutch. No, I think you should have like one okay, section well. that's like a bunch of mini sections for all the stuff that doesn't warrant a, a forty minute discussion. 